for this kind of introduction. Um, can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Um, also, thank you so much, uh, Roger, for your pre-presentation. Of course, it's uh, a little bit unfortunate that Brenton was skipping because I kind of related my paper a little bit to his presentation. Um, and I also have a confession to make. My paper deviated a little bit from the proposed abstract, and this is due to um, actually the conversations of this really interesting and great conference uh, we had so far. And I think it was Karl Raschke saying before that wherever we talk about decoloniality, we talk about language and land. And this, this concept or this thinking about language uh, came up in, in, all, in, in, in all of the three days. And um, Tink Tinka talked about the power of naming as a power of colonial language. And um, I think it was Carl yesterday who said that language manifests as a problem in Heidegger when we talk about being, which I will come back in my paper to. So um, I think it was one of the, uh, someone said before that the, the way of changing the world as the world is governed is also like an approach of, of, of the decoloniality movement. And I think we will all agree uh, with Mignolo and Walsh's book that one of the way to govern the world is with language. And as I think it was Roger before said, there is not a universal to the decolonizing act or the decolonizing process. Everyone has to go from where we somehow, you know, come from, which uh, for me, you know, as you can tell from, uh, I'm thinking from this Western grammar and I, I have a traumatic uh, analysis with that, my very own grammar, because I know the semantic register it imposed on the world, which was a, um, very traumatic register. So in my talk, I'm also very sorry, it will get probably very theoretical. I have to share the screen um, real quick. I have a presentation, if that is okay. Does this work? Can you see that? Um, yes, okay. we can. Wonderful. My talk is titled uh, Respublica Nullius Landscape Language Occupation, and we can talk uh, afterwards if there is interest how I would relate to what I'm about to say now to this talk. I have three epigraphs and then I have three interventions. Um, the first one is by Franz Fanon. Uh, we attach a fundamental importance to the phenomenon of language and consequently consider the study of language essential for providing us with one element in understanding the black man's dimension of being for others. It being understood that to speak is to exist absolutely for the other. The second one is by Sylvia Winter, and here I was um, relating um, a little bit to Brandon's presentation, or I wanted to open up a dialogue with him. Um, for the new believers, the jar belonged to a precise past of facts and dates and figures of which they were totally ignorant. And even if they had been able to read in the history books, they would have found themselves only in the blank spaces between the lines. In the darks, the pauses between commas, semicolons, colons, in the microscopic shadow world between full stops, between the interstices of every date on which a deed was done, they haunted the pages, imprisoned in mute anonymity, the done twos who had made possible the deed. And the last one is by Michel Foucault, um, the bad Michel Foucault, who also messed it up, but sometimes he also had his uh, bright moments, uh, which I would agree uh, was this one. Language about the outside of all language, speech about the invisible side of words, and it becomes attentiveness to what in language already exists, has already been said, imprinted, manifested, a listening less to what is articulated in language than to the void circulating between its words, to the murmur that is forever taking it apart, a discourse on the non-discourse of all language, the fiction of the invisible space in which it appears. And Fred Moten and Stefano Horney's seditious intervention entitled The Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, one reads the following. Study is something not where everybody dissolves into the student, but where people sort of take turns doing things for each other or for the others, and where you allow yourself to be possessed by others as they do something that also is a kind of dispossession. I would like to take up the idea of study as a sort of sociality that is enabled by the expropriative gesture of a community formation that gathers not so much under the rubric of what it has in common, but by what it has to give up 
in the very moment it comes together. In this respect, study is not just a way of thinking together with others, but also a way to get away from one's own preconceptions and epistemic holdings. One, inner frontiers. Starting off with the German Enlightenment philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte, according to Etienne Balibar, a quite ambivalent master thinker, ambivalent because it is quite unclear until this day if Fichte has to be grouped, to quote Balibar, among the heralds of freedom, or if he is a forerunner of totalitarianism, a defender of law and rational consciousness, or a precursor of irrationalism and organicism, not to mention racism. Quote end. But if his powerful and lastingly influential addresses to the German nation from 1808 truly touches a spot with the proposition that, quote Fichte, to begin with and above all else, the first original and truly natural frontiers of states are undoubtedly their inner frontiers, then we have to look at and begin right there. For Fichte, this means one has to begin with language and the principle of separation and demarcation inherent to it. Those who speak the same language are already before all human art joined together by mere nature with a multitude of invisible ties. They understand one another and are able to communicate. Ever more clearly, they belong together and are naturally one, an indivisible whole. No other nation of a different descent or, descent or language can desire to absorb and assimilate such a people without at least temporarily becoming confused and profoundly disturbing the steady progress of its own culture. The external limits of territories only follow as a consequence of this inner frontier drawn by men's spiritual nature itself. Those who speak, speak with in order to find and define each other to determine a common ground of cultural affiliation, this ground which is based in the same language has to dissipate into the ones speaking this very language and the ones others who do not. Building a unified nation, according to Fichte, starts with the recognition and the establishment of a monolingual community. At the same time, it is quite difficult to, to actually localize the different communities at work in this very passage and how they relate to each other. The frontier obviously does not threaten the nation from a territorial outside, but cuts through it and splits the nation from the inside out. Even before the physical enclosure of a certain territory in which a legal and institutional structure is put in place by the political forces that delimit and define the respective state, a certain disarray is already at work. Fish the scene of confusion and entanglement in which a linguistic inner outside mingles with a somewhat native or innate tongue, a lingua nasci depicts the birth of a nation as a construct based on the task to keep apart what is already threatening of being involved, difference. The claim that assimilation processes are only possible under the premise of losing the linguistic unity or innate purity sounds more like a warning or a threat addressed to the invading hordes of the French nation that occupied the German nation at the time of Fichte's lecture. But it remains entirely unclear why this confusion would be only a one-way undertaking. What about the steady progress of the local and domestic culture, which inevitably has to deal with the linguistic interactions with others as well? How is the language of the other affecting it? What about multilingual foreigners in general, which are able to speak different languages and therefore understand one another as clearly. To which nation or culture do they belong then? Or put differently, how is otherness affecting the notion of a culture in that it makes something like a monolingualism impossible? What Fichte's staggering concept of an inner frontier highlights is a truly productive confusion and uncertainty concerning the actual outline of this frontier. What is more important in my view in this conception is that the possibility for others speaking from within the state apparatus or in confrontation with it is kept open at any time. Two, interiorized outside. The nexus of politics, language and belonging as major building blocks for the formation of a nation state, but also as crucial force fields 
Within it is prominently highlighted by Judith Butler in her short conversational piece with Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who sings the nation state, politics, language, belonging. The gateway of Butler's argument aligns with what we mentioned so far, namely that, quote Butler, language becomes one way of asserting critical control over who belongs and who does not. What remains unresolved in this formulation is the question of who decides and determines the ownership over that language of control, who instantiates the concepts of order rooted in the desire to create a system of division and partition, which in separating the citizens from non-citizens produces statelessness as a normative category. Butler argues that statelessness itself is a state of belonging in which the status of the stateless is one of being deprived or stripped of a legal juridical status. The stateless belong to the state only in being dispossessed from the right to claim the citizen's right to gain legal status within the state. Butler writes, in different ways, they are significantly contained within the polis as its interiorized outside. Butler, in praising Hannah Arendt for her unswerving commitment to always take a clear stance in the various difficult political issues she commented on, takes issue with Arendt's passing over and leaving out the particular sphere of this inner outside of the political. In engaging critically with the distinct sphere, the position and the potential of the non-political would have to be rethought from the perspective of the excluded, not as a figure absent from the political order, which according to Arendt would have to strive for and gain political sovereignty in order to be able to take part and participate in the political sphere of the polis, but as a necessary condition for the possibility of the political itself. The interiorized outsiders are a part of it apart from it. Arendt's description in the human condition, writes Butler, leaves uncriticized this particular economy in which the public and the proper sphere of politics depends essentially upon the non-political or rather the explicitly depolitized, depoliticized, sorry, suggesting that only through recourse to another framework of power can we hope to describe the economic injustice and political dispossessions upon which the official polity depends and which it reproduces time and again as part of its efforts at national self-definition. In her criticism of the nation state, Arendt declares herself in favor of an alternate form of polity, such as the Greek polis, to which the stateless first and foremost have to be repatriated. As a basic human right, in her view, one needs to belong somewhere, even if one lives in an alien land or in regard to the nation state territory and native nowhere. What Arendt seems to leave out of her conception of the task to claim political presence for foreigners and refugees, though, is the important aspect of sociability, sociality. In famously drawing a line between the political and the social, Arendt, according to in her own words, was not interested in the social. Um, being a political being means for Arendt to belong to a public realm in which subjects speak and act. Arendt seems not to be too much attuned to the problem and language of the outsider that inhabits and is already a part of the city. The metequa, Fred Moten says, the non-citizen, the one who is subject to but not a subject of the state. In ancient Greece, the metoikos the one who is outside of the house, the one who changes houses or households is usually the freed slave, the former slave. And this is, a, in my view, a big blind spot that Arendt has because already in Greek culture, you have um, the metoikos being a part of this, you know, Western um, birthplace of something like political theory. Who thinks the nation state? For Butler, the multiple metoikoi, for example, who inhabit the city, without having the proper recognition of being fully citizens, non-resident aliens, illegal immigrants, migrant workers. In singing the Spanish version of the American national anthem, the Nuestro Hymno, they celebrate their sense of unbelonging in performing a different kind of collective we. Apart from the monolingualism of the nation, 
they changed the national language while recapturing the public space. The politicized space of the streets becomes a place of recognition and belonging for the ones excluded from the status of American citizenship in which they are able to express and celebrate their non-citizenship. What comes into presence in these acts of appearance or in this scene of expropriation of a national heritage, and this seems to be one of Butler's crucial focal points, is a sovereign speech act performed not by or according to the structural principle of the sovereign state, but by voices coming from the interiorized outside. This non-space of political action inhabited by the state's unsovereign non-citizens. What interests me in this staged encounter is how sovereignty and self-determination, which are functionally linked with each other, how they also distort or deform each other. If sovereignty consists in the power to define the terms, both boundaries and words, like friend or enemy, which organize the space of the political, it is important to pay attention to the counter spaces created and organized by what Moten calls, quote, the insovereign modes of life that make possible and even instantiate the critical displacement of sovereignty. Three, apolis. The space of the political, the polis, and how this space is organized, or rather how the question of organization is posed in it, is something to expand and explore further. For Arendt to begin with, the organization of the polis, quote Arendt, is physically secured by the wall around the city and physiognomically guaranteed by its laws. This again speaks to Arendt's very binary conception. Um, the wall that secures the polis, the enclosure that keeps it separated from the outside is also the decisive factor at the heart of its mythological foundation. And following this threat of a mythical foundation of the concept of the polis, one may be reminded of Martin Heidegger's lecture course on the introduction to metaphysics from 1935. In the chapter about being and thinking, and according to Tink, we are in the midst of the noun, the bad German noun language where being and thinking is capitalized, um, in which Heidegger, and he puts as the essential opening of human being, a method Heidegger himself describes as poetic thinking. One can read the following as Heidegger's attempt to contour the definition of the po po polis poetically. One translates polis as state and city-state. This does not capture the entire sense. Rather, polis is the name for the site, the here within which and which as which being here is as historical. The polis is the site of history, the here in which, out of which, and for which history happens. In the first phase of his meticulous but necessarily insufficient, that's Heidegger's words, interpretation of the first choral ode of Sophocles' Antigone, Heidegger, quote, stresses what provides the inner integrity of the poem. So Heidegger is using a poem to define something like being and the polis. This integrity or solidity or soundness we could translate it to is located in its ambiguity with which the saying of the Greeks traverses the opposed confrontations of being. So here, can, here can, we can see already that for Heidegger, the noun being already becomes a linguistic problem rather than a definable term. The insufficiency originates from the ambiguous integrity of the poem itself and how the question of the human being is addressed and structured within it. If a discussion of being and the famous definition of the specificity of the human being in Sophocles' choral ode can only take place in a literal setting out and apart from one another, then the human being, as it is disposing itself in a certain way, which is the poem in Heidegger's interpretation, is split and can only be itself in opposition to itself, an inwardly counter-turning essence. And it's a very famous phrase Heidegger is using, inwardly counter-turning essence. The authentic definition of humanity, Heidegger writes, 
which is again the integrity with which the poem speaks of it, can only speak these words in verses or inversely. The sustaining and prominent phrase, Heidegger writes, on which Heidegger is focusing his attention in the poem, is said as verse, that's Heidegger's words, of the word which itself already carries something like growing and grasping for something else, one can only speak in verses. Furthermore, the word itself only appears as a composite of words. Heidegger is speaking of the word as constructed, thus also the phrase polis as being said in the famous verse 370, in which it appears in the opposing positionality of Hypsipolis, Apolis, and I'm speaking about the third to last um, verse, rising high over the side, losing the side, Hypsipolis, Apolis. The polis, the ground and place of human being here itself, as Heidegger had it, the spot where all the roads cross, is itself routed and crossed in the verse that is speaking of the word. The polis rising high above the side and losing or for fighting the side. And this counter-turning coupling Heidegger constitutes his very own definition of the polis. In a thought-provoking move, Heidegger retracts from equating polis with the political and defines it rather as that which cannot be defined in political terms. The polis cannot be determined politically. For Heidegger, the polis is not a political concept per se. The root of what is called polis is routed in an appositional polarity between Hypsipolis and Apolis. The political takes place and is put in place by the ones belonging to its side of history. First and foremost, the gods, the priests, the poets, the thinker, the ruler, the council of elders, the assembly of the people, the armed forces. They are the ones founding, defining, and setting the terms of the polis. Rather than finding themselves in it or being just a part of it, they are the ones giving the space and therefore placing the polis in the first place. The more important part of this process, though, is the interminability of these acts of giving place to the polis, which itself takes place in all kinds of utterances and performative gestures. Being the noun, as Tink said, is always already being political, the verb form. This interminability of the essence of the polis is the essential insight Heidegger is stressing in regards to it. The very essence of the polis is essentially without essence, indefinite and indeterminable, apolis. Within the polis, the political becomes interminable, always above and always beyond it. To wrap things up, I would like to highlight this strange and unique relationship of polis and apolis. What I would like to keep in mind or put up for discussion in regards to this passage in Heidegger is a conception of the polis as historical site grounded in an inwardly counter-turning essence, which actually makes impossible any proposition of an essence of the political without having to take into account the role of apoliticality as its condition of possibility. Furthermore, I would like to draw some attention to the importance of poetry and the way Heidegger mobilizes the poets and their voicings to sound out the concepts of politics or the human being as such. Contrary to the generalizing mentions of German thought and language as part of the normative and exclusionary foundation of colonial order, we find ourselves right in between what Heidegger calls poetizing thinking and thought poetry. Line by line, the poem splits and takes apart the polis in its inverse nature. In thinking about the materiality of words and language in which the terms are being set and the boundary lines are determined, I would like to put an important emphasis on the assumption that focusing on words and terms is not confined to some sort of dematerialized linguistic realm above and beyond the real world where violence and power act on material bodies. Instead, it is a call to reconceptualize the mechanisms which relate conceptual order to terrestrial space and to reconceptualize the materiality of words themselves. 
What I'm pleading for here simply is to be careful or care for the words we use because we are already bound up in them. Literally, language matters because it is a matter of life and death. Thank you.